<laughs> and so I'm very pleased to have Andrew Jordan, a colleague from Rochester University. Andrew is a distinguished theorist of quantum measurement, quantum theory, and various things like this. And uh, my name is Kater Birch. I'm from Washington University. I'm an experimentalist. I have a laboratory that's just, you drill the hole down that way, about 10 feet, you'd be in my laboratory. And uh, so we're going to discuss some work that we've been working on for maybe almost two years now, I think. That's right. This has been uh, supported by the John Templeton Foundation. It's a chance for us to really ask some deep questions about the structure of time. We want to acknowledge them before we get started. So it touches on things in physics, but it also touches on things in philosophy, now the meaning of it all. So we're talking about time and arrows of time, right? And uh, we all probably agree that time seems to go forward. Right? And the question is why? Okay? This, you know, glasses break, they don't kind of unbreak. So there's sort of a directionality to time. And that's the kind of question we want to get into today. And, and we have a very visceral experience of that. We remember the past. The past is clear to us. We can remember our childhood, our experiences, our first date. But we can't know the future. We don't know what it's going to be like when we die or when we uh, happen to. Get a, get a parking ticket next week, or when the stock market goes up or goes down. Those are things that are beyond our ability to know. And is it the case that those things don't really exist until they actually happen? Or maybe they actually really exist all the time, and we just are sort of gliding along, uncovering pre-existing events that just happen to be there. Yeah. So the arrow of time, well, physics has a fancy name for it. And it's called the second law of thermodynamics. And it's a kind of a funny law in that it's, most laws are this works this way always. But the second law of thermodynamics says entropy, which has to do with maybe disorder and so forth. We'll talk more about that. But entropy sort of always increases. Generally, it increases. Sometimes it decreases, but most, for the most part, it increases. So it's not a very good law in some sense. And that's what's so funny about it. So a classic example is uh, you know a room can be nice and tidy. There's one way for it to be neat and tidy and ordered. And there's lots of ways for it to be messy. And so that's in some sense why my son's room often looks like that one to the right, the disordered one. And you could you know you don't just have to think this happened earlier than this. This is kind of the outcome of time passing. And so how is it that the kids' room is ever clean, Gator? Well, <laughs> you have to you know they have to actually do work to clean it up, right? Oh, so yeah. you have to put things away, and that actually is. A lot of what thermodynamics is about is this relationship between entropy and disorder and work. Okay. So, so sometimes thing. you have to do some work in order to put it from a disordered state back to an ordered state. Yeah. But the thing that um, we should consider is the physical laws and uh, how do they how do they enforce this? How do they behave when you consider time symmetry? Or yeah, so it's a funny thing. So when we look at the physical laws of nature, for example, this is the laws of classical physics, like Newton's laws over there. So those are the laws that are drawn up around the blackboard. We teach the freshmen here at Washington University. It tells us how motion uh, objects move when they're experienced forces and things like that. And the funny thing is, is that uh, th these are some equations. I'll go a little bit into them, but it's not so important what they mean. But the funny thing is, is if I write down these equations that describe the laws of nature, you see the variable cap, a little t there. That, that means time in this formulation. And the variables p and q, that's talking about, for example, a single particle, what its coordinate is in space, and what its momentum is. Sometimes remember, if you just wrote, what is momentum? That's simply the mass of an object times its speed or velocity. And uh, if we want to describe how an object changes, I need to figure out how its coordinates, its position, and its momentum change in time. Okay? So those equations tell us what happens when a, an object is being exerted, a force is being exerted on an object. And the funny thing is, if I take those equations, I take formally time, what I would call time variable, and I flip it to minus time. And I flip, take the momentum, and I flip the momentum, the speed of the velocity, particles going like this, I simply flip the velocity to go back like this, the equations are exactly the same. So it's kind of like you have a play button on a movie. You play it forward and you play it backwards. In order to play it backwards, you just well, reverse time, but you, then you also reverse 
the directions in some sense of the that, That's right. So that funny transformation <laughs> I'm talking about is exactly like when you have your VCR remote in your hand and you hit the rewind button. That's exactly what the time we call sometimes called the time reversal operation. That's what the rewind button is doing. It's implementing a time reversal operation. So it's really a kind of a concrete thing you have some experience with. Okay. So I understand you have some okay, experience yeah. you can show you. All right. So, so even though Pater is experimentalist, I, a humble theorist, sometimes get my hands dirty as well and do go into the laboratory and do experiments. In this case, my laboratory is the pool table. <coughs> So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be showing you a couple of movies here. One of the movies is going to be playing, playing forward in time, and the other movie will be played backward in time, and I want you to guess which is which. So let's first uh, see one of them. Okay. Okay, so that's one movie. What do you think? Is that going forward in time or backward in time? It's hard to tell. Let's we'll put a second one. Okay, what about that one? It's going opposite of the first one. <laughs> it's going opposite of the first one, that's right. So we have, we have a binary choice here. Is it forward or back? And this illustrates in, in a pictorial form, what I was just telling you in words, that if I reverse the, 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 the velocity and the time, it, it looks exactly like a legitimate forward movie, except for this pesky thing called friction sometimes we like to talk about. Okay. But it turns out that it turns out the one on the left is going backward in time, uh, in actuality, when I was actually filming it, and the one on the right is going forward in time. But now suppose we do something uh, a little bit different. Let's bring more than just one pool ball into the game. Let's take a couple of pool balls and watch a couple more movies, and we're trying to guess which one is past and which one is future. Okay, so there's one. And there's the other. Now which one is fast, and which one is going forward in time, which one is going backward? The first one was forward in time. The first one is forward and the back one is backward. So we can kind of see it more clearly when we have more degrees of freedom in the game. But let's keep playing this game. Let's add another degree of freedom. Go ahead, Peter. Three balls. <laughs> and now it begins to tell. You can say, oh yeah, the one on the right, that was the funny one, right? That's the one you don't usually see. Okay, well, let's take this to an extreme level here, Peter. Okay. Yeah. And now we begin to think about not just past and future, but we're thinking about Peter's son's bedroom again, <laughs> about order versus disorder. So let's watch this movie. The Fool Break. <laughs> and the unbreak. Okay. Yeah. So the unbreak, I tell you with all honesty, is a physically legitimate evolution. If I gave it, okay, forgetting about friction, if I gave all those balls exactly the right speed and position, that backwards movie is allowed by the laws of physics. And even though it's allowed by the laws of physics, we can still tell the difference about which way time is going by this. Uh, argument that Peter was giving about the transition from order to disorder. We know on the right hand side that's a special configuration, that's an ordered configuration, whereas the, and there's only a, only a few ways of putting that <coughs> array of balls together, but on the right that's a more disordered way, so there are many ways of putting that configuration of balls together. So Andrew. That's why you need cues to play cool. <laughs> <laughs> Push them around. But, but if you look closely <laughs> You know, if we look closely at one of these pool cubes, right, pool balls, and you look really closely, we know that they're made out of atoms and molecules. And atoms and molecules and so forth are described by a completely different type of physics, that is quantum physics. That, so that's isn't, right. isn't the game up? I mean, is, isn't the answer deeper in some sense? That's a good question. So maybe we should not be thinking about the laws of Newton's laws, but perhaps this mystery about past and future could help, we could solve this mystery if we understood more deeply what the laws of quantum mechanics are telling us about reality. Okay, well, here's some quantum laws. What do they tell us about okay, time yeah. reversibility? Okay, so we have some more equations up there now. And just like we were showing some equations before that was telling us about how balls move, for example, under the influence of forces, in quantum mechanics, we have to have a new set of laws. <clears throat> this is the physics of the very small. So rather than a position and a momentum, like those are 
quantum or classical coordinates for a, for a particle, we have a new set of coordinates. And that coordinate is sometimes called a quantum state or a wave function. And they write it with this funny Greek letter psi over there. All right, so, so we had Janus, the Roman god of time, and now we're going over to the Greeks to, to write our equations. Uh, so we have the, this, is, this is a equation discovered by the Austrian physicist Erwin Schrodinger. And the funny thing is, you might say, well, maybe this tells us about uh, why the error of time emerges. Let's think about this law of, of motion. This tells us how this quantum coordinates, the wave function, changes in time. Let's do the same game I was playing before. Let's flip the time to the minus the time. And it turns out that the analog of flipping the momentum to minus the momentum here is basically complex conjugating the wave function. That doesn't matter. There's just some transformation we do. And lo and behold, if we do all that, what happens, Gator? Well, it becomes the same. It's just like playing the movie backwards. It's exactly it's, the same as it was same before. Equations. So going it's backwards in time in quantum mechanics is fully legitimate. It's just like you would be going forward in time in quantum mechanics as well. But what about measurement? Ooh. That is, measurement's a funny thing in quantum mechanics. It's not as simple as using ruler to measure things, of course, because this ruler is made up of atoms and molecules and so forth. So you got to yeah. it's tricky. And what I remember about measurement is that you have some sort of spooky quantum superposition. Have you heard of this before? Yeah, superposition. And you measure it, something happens. You know what that's called? Collapse, just like this. <laughs> and this is actually what I study in lab. You can see we do it in St. Louis because there's art. <laughs> so this, this, is, this is one of the profound differences, Cater, between quantum mechanics and classical mechanics. Because in classical mechanics, the act of measurement is almost a trivial operation. You say we have some intrinsic reality that exists. It exists whether we're here or we're not. We just have to come along and look at it, and it just simply reveals the value that it was there all along. <laughs> but in quantum mechanics, something different happens, which is that the act of the measurement turns out to not be just revealing what's there, but the act of measurement must intrinsically change the reality, must change the quantum state that we're, that we're investigating. Hmm. So one of the great paradigms, now people didn't like this when this was first discovered. People really hated this idea. And even the founders of quantum mechanics, the ones that discovered it, they hated this idea too. But they couldn't get away with it because they couldn't get away with it because it was sort of the reality they kept butting their heads against. And one of the classic examples they wanted to think about in order to illustrate how absurd this idea was of, of superposition and measurement collapse and so on was this idea of Schrodinger's cat. Tell us about this cat. Well, so this is yeah, so this is a classic measurement apparatus in some sense. You have some radioactive atom that has a 50% chance of decaying. And we rig up this diabolical apparatus such that if the atom decays, a hammer drops and a vial of poison is killing the cat. But if the atom doesn't decay, then the cat's alive. Okay. And so we put close the box and we, we let this situation evolve. And quantum mechanically, the, the atom is both decayed and not decayed. It's in a superposition of these two states. And therefore, the cat is both alive and not alive, alive and dead at the same time. And then something very funny happens. If you open up the box, well, the cat's going to be alive or dead. Right? You don't see the cat. Yeah, that's the one or the other. So that's the funny thing about measurement is that you never see superposition. If you try to catch the superposition in the act, it never says I'm in a superposition of alive and dead or decayed or not decayed. So it always says alive or dead. Yeah. So open by, by opening the box, you force the poor cat to take a stand. It's got to be alive or dead at that moment. So there's something really funny going on. Yeah. With measurement. So how do you know it wasn't really alive or dead the whole time, Cater? And we just, we just our, our limited minds can't quite appreciate that. Well, let me let me tell you about how we understand that in experiments. Okay, okay? good. And we can actually do experiments that highlight how this sort of spooky sense essence of a superposition really is there. But, but maybe before we do that, let's think about this this idea of time reversal we've been talking about in the context of this measurement, this wave function class. So you see on the slide there that this, usually what happens in a quantum mechanics experiment is you make a preparation of a state, you let the thing evolve, just let, let, let your stopwatch move forward in time, and that those, you know, we already saw that those are time reversible. I can go forward in time, I can go backward in time. It doesn't care about this error of time. But seemingly now we find that the measurement breaks that. That you can go forward, you can collapse the wave function, but you can't uncollapse. Or, or maybe you can. 
<laughs> so let's let's take a tour down to my lab, and we'll do some experiments. Okay, so my laboratory, lots of equipment. We have what we call a dilution refrigerator. This is an apparatus that we use to cool circuits down to just a hair's breadth above absolute zero, temperature of a hundred of a degree above absolute zero. So we open up this dilution refrigerator and lots and of layers. Here, how, of how, cold, how cold is that? So if I want to ten, ten millicom. It's, it's so so oh. to give that to me in, in Fahrenheit or something. Well, minus, minus two hundred and seventy-three Celsius. Okay. Right. And, and so water freezes at zero, right? Water freezes at zero. Okay. So very cold. Colder than anywhere, colder than outer space, colder than anywhere else in the, else in the universe, aside from other experiments here on Earth that do this. So very cold. All right. So <laughs> inside this, these layers of shielding, we add the shielding and so forth. We make a microfabricated circuit. Okay. And the thing about quantum mechanics is quantum mechanics say the circuit can't just have any old energy. It has specific quantized energy levels. That's why we have used the word quantum. Okay, so we have these two energy levels: a lower energy level and a higher energy level. And we hide this, these sort of quantum energy levels, in a box. Okay, so let's just simplify away all of the, the, the complication of this experiment, and let's just consider what we're actually looking at, which is um, described very well by this analogy. Okay, so what we have is a a box, and it has, in some sense, two shells. These are these energy states. Okay. And you can think about uh, a ball, and the ball can sit on one shelf, the lower shelf, or the upper shelf. Okay. Mm -hmm. And now what we're going to do is we're going to close the box, but we're going to do experiments on this, and then eventually open the box, and we'll see what we learn about the rules of quantum mechanics just by very simple experiments with this box. Okay. So, so I'll, I'll give you a view of what's happening, but really this is what's happening after we do the experiment. So let me see. So one of the funny rules about this system um, is that if we send in a pulse of energy, so it has just the right energy, it's just the right amplitude, it's just the right length, we can set that up so that 100% of the time, the ball goes from the bottom shelf to the top shelf. Okay? And it turns out, if you send that same pulse of energy and the ball's on the top shelf, 100% of the time, it'll go back down to the bottom shelf. Okay? This is just kind of the peculiar way this works, just how the Schrodinger equation describes its evolution and so forth. But what happens if it gets in the box? <laughs> How does it work? Yeah, what happens if you take it out of the box? So this is, in some sense, you can think about this ball as being you know, an electron trapped to an atom. So this is the system we have. We put the, the, the ball in the box. It's the, the, the physical system we construct. But if you put a ball in a normal box, it could be anywhere in the box with whatever energy you want it. Yeah. But in quantum mechanics, though, it says it doesn't work that way anymore. You can only have these special energies, one of two possibilities. And those are like, having a, a chest of drawers with two shelves, and Cater is saying you can put the box in the bottom shelf or in the top shelf, and if we look which shelf it's in, it's always in the top shelf or the bottom shelf. Yeah, okay. So, what if we send in a half pulse? Or a pulse of energy bringing it back down into the other side. Now let's send in a half pulse. This is a pulse that is maybe half of the amplitude, or it's half as long. It doesn't have to have this funny shape. It's just sort of half as much, okay? Well, when we open the box after sending the half pulse, we find that half the time the ball's in the top shelf, and half the time the ball's on the bottom shelf. Okay? Now, does this mean that it's just a 50% probability of it working? The pulse works half the time, and half the time it doesn't work? Or is there something deeper going on? Yeah, that would be our classical reasoning. It's just sort of a faulty pulse. It only Same works on one shelf or the other. Right? Okay, but something much deeper is going on. And let me show that to you by means of a counterexample. So let's assume that this is actually all that's going on, 50% probability, that it just works half the time. Then what would happen if we sent in two of these half pulses? Okay. Well, the first pulse is going to take the ball to the top shelf half the time. So it's said that half of it goes up, right? The second pulse, if it's on the top, will take it to the bottom, and if it's on the bottom, it'll take it to the top, right? So you can think about half of what's on the top going to the bottom, and half of the bottom going to the top. So again, we have. 50% probability of it being on top shelf. That is, the second pulse would have no effect. So if it was just a 50% probability of sending to the top shelf, the second pulse would have no effect. Okay? But that's not what we see. In fact, what we see is if you had two of these half pulses, it goes to the top shelf 100% of the time. And what does that mean? That means there has to be some sort of stable state that's both the top shelf and the bottom shelf. Some sort of 
intermediate shelf, in some sense, that it sits on between the two pulses. Wait a minute, let me get this straight, Hater. So you're saying there's some kind of intermediate shelf, but if I come and poke you looking around at your box, and I look for this other shelf, it's never there. Yeah, there's, and we've told you before, there's not, there are, there are two shelves, okay? So the only conclusion is that the intermediate shelf is some sort of combination of the two shelves. It's in a superposition of being on the bottom shelf and the top shelf. <laughs> Join the club. Let's start there. Uh, let's, let me say, um, if you send in two half pulses, what you get is exactly the same behavior that you intend in one pulse. That's right. But here I've taken that pulse and I've separated it in time. Okay. So the first, so one pulse we know takes us to the top. Half pulse works half the time. So it's not but two half pulses. It has, it's some, doing something, it's somewhere in, in between that kind of remembers that you sent this first pulse. Yeah. But when you open the box, it's as though it didn't recognize the separation in time. But when you open the box, it's always on one shelf or the other, and that's the bit we're going to try to really to, to analyze here. How far can you separate from time? Well, that has to do with the particular, particularly how perfectly quantum this, this device is. But, but in principle, as far as you want. As far as you want. In our lab, <laughs> maybe it's just 10 microseconds. It's not quite as good, but that's a but long in theory time. world, in theory world, it, it, it's as long as you want. Okay. Um, and then another point is that if I put in a sort of a half pulse of negative amplitude, so change the phase or something, okay. so I'm still sending a pulse, I get a different one of these superposition states. In fact, I can have any possible combination of top shelf and bottom shelf by sending in pulses of different durations. And in quantum mechanics, this is what we call, this appears this Greek letter psi again. This is what we call a wave function. It says, it's just a combination of the top shelf and the bottom shelf, and I can just choose the coefficients alpha and beta as it like. Okay, so it can be in one of these quantum superpositions. <coughs> All right, well, what happens when you measure it? So when you measure it, I come back to my same point. It's only two shelves, so you only get Upper shelf or lower shelf. Yeah, so it's like a cat. When you open the box, it's either alive or it's dead. But somehow we know that there's something deeper going on. Okay. So, so again, so again, this this bothered uh, scientists quite a lot. Einstein, in particular, had lots of papers trying to come to grips with this. His famous quote is that I cannot accept that God plays dice with the universe. Hmm. But yet we're saying fundamentally that once we make this measurement. The, 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 the result that we find is intrinsically probabilistic. So go back to your previous slide for a second there, Kater. So when Kater writes down this uh, wave function there, and I look and I measure it with this superposition, I always find top and bottom, and there's no way that we know to go beyond that. So the laws of quantum mechanics tell us fundamentally this is a random process at its most fundamental level. There's nothing more fundamental that we know of is able to predict what the result of the experiment is. And that's why quantum mechanics is so profoundly different to the classical physics, is because there is this intrinsic uncertainty uh, about the results we find. We find top shelf or bottom shelf with some probabilities, and that's all quantum mechanics allows us to say. And so this is the what we talked about, where something about this measurement process seems to really break time symmetry, okay? or does it? The question is, can we take this process and can we measure it in a more gentle way? Yeah, so what, instead of just sort of nakedly ripping the band-aid off, opening the box and saying if the cat is alive or dead, what if we did something not quite so drastic and we sort of peeked at the cat? Is there, is there something we can learn from So like, what, for example, I can imagine um, cutting a tiny hole in the box okay, and sending a very feeble laser beam through the box Okay, just one or two photons at a time, and just very slowly peek at the box. And that's the kind of experiment we're going to do. Okay. And in order to understand what this, how the experiment makes sense, let's first calibrate the apparatus. Let's put the ball on the bottom shelf and just sort of see what happens when the light comes through. Okay. So I've cut a tiny hole in the box, I'm sending in the laser, and I'm measuring the detector and counting photons. Okay. And I'm getting, say, three photons, two photons, one photon, five photons, four photons. It's kind of strange. The stream of photons is not perfectly steady. That's also sort of a quantum feature. This is the shotness of light. The fact that it comes in individual photons, and they don't line up in a neat cube, but they actually kind of line up in a random 
fine. Okay, but we get three photons, two photons, one photon, five photons. So on average, you're going to get three photons. But sometimes we get more, and sometimes we get less. Okay, so it's a sort of there's some uncertainty. Okay, now let's stick the, the ball in the top shelf. Remember, we know how to do this. We send in one of these whole pulses. It's the top shelf. Now we send in the laser beam, and we get five photons, four photons, two photons. We get slightly more photons through on average. And you can imagine that the balls in the top shelf is blocking less of the laser beam or something like that. And so I've plotted a histogram of what happens when we have the ball on the top shelf. That's in red. It's there on average is five, but sometimes it's as few as three. Okay. So in a way, you're saying we can use this counting of photons as a kind of a, a noisy detector to figure yeah. out is it in the top shelf or the bottom shelf if we were to average over a bunch of yeah. events, something like that. Right. So now let's go back to our, our superposition. So we apply this after this. <coughs> We have this special state. It's both the top shelf and the bottom shelf at the same time. Okay, and we want to now slowly probe it. Okay, and so let's do that. We put, we apply the path pulse, so now it's in the superposition state, and we send in the, the light. And the first thing the detector says is seven. Okay, seven is right there. Now, what do you guys think? Given that we detected seven photons, is it more likely it's on the top shelf than is the red shelf? Or the bottom shelf? Equal. <laughs> Seems like it's more likely to be on the top shelf, right? Because the top shelf is this distribution. It'd be more likely to get this value if it happened to be in that state. The sort of intuitive reasoning actually is, is, a, is, a, is a very old idea. So, so, so this idea we had about if, if we got some extreme event, that, that gave us the intuition that it must have been really on, on the top shelf, that red shelf, because, that, because if it were on the bottom shelf, that event would have been a very, very, very unlikely to have occurred. All right. You can see and, it's, yeah, it's just incredibly unlikely to get that if it was on, I it was on the, the, the blue shelf. That's right. And so that kind of thinking, that way of reasoning about probabilities, there's the science and the mathematics associated with that reasoning about probabilities. And that was a branch of mathematics that was begun long, long time ago, long time before people discovered quantum mechanics, and we call it probability theory. And so probability theory, you're familiar with that in terms of throwing dice or flipping coins and trying to reason about the odds. And so uh, one of the central results in this is, is a result discovered by this man, Thomas Bayes, uh, in the 1700s. And what he discovered is this very simple formula written on the right that said uh, it related to something called conditional probabilities to each other. So if I ask you what's the probability of A given B versus the probability of B given A, how would I distinguish, or how are those things different? And one way you can think about what are the difference between those two conditional probabilities is what if I asked you, what is the probability that you're pregnant given that you're a woman, or what is the probability that you're a woman given that you're pregnant? Right? Those are two. Those are two very different things. Right? And and so uh, so so this little formula allows you to relate those when you flip the conditioning of the two propositions. So you can think a little bit about B in terms of doing science. This will helps us allow us to to change our mind about the odds given new information. So if I think about if I think about B, this proposition B, as some experiment that I've done and I acquire some new bit information. And that allows me then to change my mind about the likelihood of some other event A given this new information. So let me try to give you an example of this, applying this idea to, a, to some sort of uncertain situation. Okay. Let's say I finish closing the shades. Okay. Right. If the shades were closed, we wouldn't be able to tell if the sun had all of a sudden gone supernova. Right? Because we can't see the light coming from it. And that's what this question is about. And what is supernova, Cater? That's when the sun explodes and it stops emitting light. Oh, okay. Okay. No, we'd be really bad. That's bad. Um, so this is an example. And the idea is, let's say it's dark or something. We have the windows drawn. We don't know if the sun has all of a sudden stopped outputting any light. Okay. But we have a neutrino detector. And neutrinos are a type of particle. They weak, interact very weakly with matter. And so it turns out that neutrinos, they come from the sun. They, they come to us when the sun's in the sky. When the sun's set, they come right through the Earth in the middle of the night. So you can tell if the sun's burning based on whether or not we're detecting neutrinos. Okay. So we have a neutrino detector, and it's measuring neutrinos. It can tell whether the shades are drawn or not that the sun is burning or not. Okay. 
But this is a tricky detector because it detects where there's, there's neutrinos, and then it rolls two dice. Okay? And if they both come up to sixes, it lies to us. Otherwise, it tells the truth. Okay? So we ask the, we ask the detector, did the sun go supernova? And it says yes. Okay, so what, how do we interpret this? There's a chance that it's lying to us, in which case we shouldn't believe it. And it's a chance it's telling the truth. So we have to use uh, statistics, probabilities, to figure out what we interpret as happening. Okay. Now, what we normally think of as statistics is, what, is this frequentist statistics. That is, you'd say, what is the probability of this event happening by chance? Okay. So the probability that it's lying to us is the probability of getting double sixes, which is 1 in 36, about 2.7%. Okay. So that's a kind of unlikely. And so you, in science, we say, well, that's a p-value of less than 0 0.05. Therefore, we conclude that the sun must have exploded. Okay. But, the, but Bayes' rule tells a different story. And Bayes in statistician is so confident he's willing to bet money on this. So what does Bayes' rule tell us in this case? Well, it tells us that the probability of a supernova, given the yes answer, that's what we want to know, that the sun actually undergo a supernova. It's equal to the probability of the yes answer given a supernova. Well, we know what that is. That's about 97%. That's the probability that the detector did not lie to us. Right? And then we multiply that by the probability of a supernova, which is really low. I think it's about zero. Okay. So zero times 97% is zero. And so that's, that's how Bayes' rule is applied. In this case. And the point I want to emphasize, if we go back to our ball on the two shelves, is that's exactly the kind of information we calibrated. These distributions tell me the probability of getting, say, n photons, given that it was on the top shelf, the probability of n photons given the bottom shelf. Those are exactly the pieces that we plug into Bayes' rule to calculate the new probability of it being on the bottom shelf or the top shelf, given that measurement information. Okay. So this is just harnesses our intuition, but it allows us to go back to the measurement <coughs> problem and use Bayes' rule to analyze how we learn about what shelf the ball is on. Okay. So let's go back to this experiment. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace, so remember that you can have any state here along the circle, top shelf, bottom shelf, top shelf, plus bottom shelf, top shelf, minus bottom shelf, any combination. And it just for simplicity, I'm going to replace it with an arrow that points to where it is. Okay, so if it's pointing up, it's on the top shelf. If it's pointing down, it's on the bottom shelf. To the side is this superposition we get by sending in a half pulse. Okay. And now we're going to start detecting photons and see how those photons change our knowledge about what shelf it's on. Okay. So if we detect six photons, well, that's a large number. It's more likely to be on the top shelf. If we detect zero photons, well, actually, that's a small number. It's more likely to be on the bottom shelf. So as time goes on, we come up with a, a sort of a movie of how the wave function Excuse evolves me, based on our detection. So six, zero, three, five. So Peter, so every time you're collecting some information, you're allowing yourself to change your mind about what superposition state that quantum uh, 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 box is in, or the ball on the shelf is in, based on the information we're getting. Mm -hmm. and that's why the arrow is moving around. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do we have a quick question? Uh, I don't understand the photons that you're collecting. Are they, I mean, you're, you're putting you're photons in the, the box, and the photons are coming out. Where are they going to go? So, the question is, he doesn't understand what the photons are, what's going on with the photons. It's like, imagine I do the experiment right here, okay? And I shine the laser beam, and you can see if it doesn't hit the, the glass, it goes over there and hits the thing. But if the glass happened to be over here, then all of a sudden the, the photon flux is slightly different. And that's just what we're doing. We're sending it through the box, and it comes out the other side. So, so you drill the little hole, and then shine the light through there, and then we're collecting photons on the other side of the hole. And that's telling how it's in the box. And of course, this is not exactly what we're doing, but it's a good enough analogy to, to give you the real piece of the physics, which is how we're able to use the information to sort of change our mind about what the state is, to sort of understand how to accumulate all of this, this information. <coughs> That's so the question is. So one measurement of what your superposition doesn't tell me anything either. So I need the average. That's right. So in, the, in fact, in this case, the question is: what the statement is you need not just one measurement, but you need many measurements. You want to need to know the average, and that's exactly what we're doing. As we detect detect photons, 
we're sort of updating the average. And the fact that the average, in this case, is all that really matters. Um, but you can, as it goes on, we keep adding these new pieces of information for prior information about the state. And that gives us a movie of wave function collapse, a movie of how the measurement takes place. Okay, so if I play from the beginning, you start here, and it's just jiggling up and down as we randomly detect photons. But eventually, maybe the average goes to a large value, and we're quite confident that it's on the top shelf. How long is this time interval? Time interval here in the, in the actual experiments, which is how long the time interval, is typically on the order of 20 nanoseconds. Okay. But it doesn't really matter. It just sort of, we have to do it fast before the superposition state falls apart for other reasons. So that's just a technical concern. It doesn't really matter what the time interval is. That's for, for each, Andrew. each measurement? Yeah. Yeah, so, so your entire duration of the movie, how long is your whole movie in your lab? Oh, to go, about, to go from superposition to two microseconds. Two so microseconds is the total. Movie. We can take a lot of movies <laughs> uh, in, a, in a minute. So we do. Okay. So this the idea is that the information changes the state of the ball, or our knowledge, uh, the state of the ball is conditioned on the information required. That's the basic idea. For your knowledge of the state. Yeah. So it's kind of strange. Why? Why would our knowledge, or you know, what we've learned? matter at all. But of course, in some sense, we're, we're part of the problem. We're the ones opening the box. That, that's the neat thing about quantum mechanics, is that somehow we find it's very difficult to separate our knowledge of the thing from the thing itself. And that's one of the deep, the deep problems. That's the, one of the things people have been struggling with since the dawn of quantum mechanics. And so to prove that this is really what we do, uh, here's, here's some actual experimental data. Okay? We actually do this, and these are what these movies look like. Um, where one of the, each one of these colored traces is a single run of experiment and how the probability goes from to being on this top and bottom shelf to, say, the top shelf or the bottom shelf. Each time we get a different random outcome, okay, the, the movie is slightly different. And the question is, you know, can we now look at these movies in the same way that we looked at the movies in the pool hall? Yeah. And make what, guesses what about. That? But before we get that, let's think about whether or not it makes sense to play these movies backwards at all. Okay, so let's see. An idea of measurement reversal. So let's go back to this movie. Okay. We start off in this superposition state. Okay, we detect six photons, zero photons, three photons, and we're back to where we started. Now, so, now wait a minute. What do you mean we're back to where we started? Well, at the, at the beginning we've been, of the movie, we've been doing measurements, but I thought that collapsed wave function. So apparently it didn't. See, look, it's pointing here. That's pointing slightly up, but slightly down, and then back to where it started. If I play that backwards, it'll look exactly the same. So what's going on there, Peter? Well, some sort of measurement <laughs> reversal. Wow. And don't act surprised. You actually studied this almost ten years. <laughs> <laughs> And you can see this in the actual experimental data. Okay. So if you look here, this, uh, this green trace, it goes down and then up and then back down again. It's where it started. Every time one of these trajectories crosses a horizontal line, that's in some sense a reversal. Okay? You could play it backwards and it would look the same. So if you measure long enough, you cannot measure at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, so, so what if we go further? So if we can reverse a measurement, maybe we can play a movie backwards. Is that even possible? So let's think about two of Peter's movies. So, so the red line there in that movie is the signal. That's what you actually measure in the lab. The blue line is the signal. Oh, sorry, the blue line is the signal. And then the red line is the, uh, the quantum state. That's, that's, that's Peter's estimation of the, of the state. Uh, as I'm measuring, that's the quantum movie. So, so, the, so the blue line is like the number of photons. It's you know uh, something plus minus da 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 da. da. Yeah. So we can think about lines. so we can think about the quantum state thing. It's sort of like the movie that we're watching, and the and the record that's in the lab. Can think about that as sort of like the soundtrack for the movie that we're listening to as we're watching the movie. It sounds like <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's noise. Uh, and so now what would happen, what would it look like if I had a time reverse of that? I would have to start then in the top shelf 
and some crazy arrangement of measurement results would have to happen to bring me back down eventually in exactly the time reversed way to the state that I started with at the beginning of my week. Just, just like that. So you can see that this, what you need is the, the soundtrack is played backwards, right? So here's what the in looks like, it's flipped over. But you also need the soundtrack to be kind of upside down. So it's, it has to undo all these things. So even though it's up here, we're getting very small values to sort of bring, to sort of cancel out what we knew, to unlearn something. So this is just like in the, in the other classical inclinations of motion. When I flip t to minus t, I had to flip momentum to minus momentum to retrace my steps. Now I have to do the same thing to do the, with the movement, with the measurement. I have to flip the sign of the measurement uh, result, and then also flip the temporal order. So if we look at these movies, can we play the same game? Can we guess whether they're going forward or backwards? For example, if I you know, play these, does the same sort of logic of which one is more likely apply? So it, so it does. It's exactly the same way of thinking that we now we can have a movie that's played either forward or backward as a legitimate movie, but we begin to be suspicious. Just like we're suspicious with the pool game, we can be suspicious that one movie, even though it's a legitimate, it's a possible movie, that the law of physics doesn't forbid it, but it's very unlikely. And we can use that same reasoning about Bayes rule. Is the time of the movie going forward, or is it being played in reverse to be able to make statistical <coughs> predictions about that? OK, so let's think about a little more about how the, the movie and the soundtrack fit together. So help us understand how unlikely or likely a certain movie would be. Okay? So just like in a, in a normal movie, that, you know, with the, of the audio and of the video, they sort of go together. One influences the other and so forth. The same thing's true in these quantum measurement movies. The measurement vector, the number of photons, influences the, the, the dynamics and vice versa. Okay? So when we're in this specific superposition state here, some sense of 50% probability of being the top shelf, 50% probability bottom shelf, but it's actually in this superposition, okay? And so the, the photon we detect, well, it's gonna be equally likely drawn from the top shelf distribution or the bottom shelf distribution, okay? So what I can do is I can take these two distributions and I'll just merge them into one slightly wider distribution. And we can think about what is the probability of getting certain results, okay? Um, so for example, if I detect six photons, well, here that occurs with some probability. It's not the most likely thing, sort of to the, toward the top of the curve, but there's some sort of probability density associated with that. Okay? But now that I know it's more likely to be on the top shelf, these distributions change. And so now I'm more likely to get results corresponding to the top shelf. There's some sort of feedback associated with the measurement. So let me get this straight. You're saying you make a measurement, and let's suppose it's a large photon number. That means it's more likely to be on the top shelf. So I change my mind and I get more on the top shelf. But that then shifts the whole distribution over. So the next one, it's going to be telling me it's even more likely that I'm on the top shelf. Right? Yeah. OK. okay. So for example, um, okay, maybe then I should change to take the studying photons. The distribution will shift back. So in some sense, I can figure out what the probability of a certain movie is by just multiplying together these probabilities, p1, p2, p3, p4, the probability of each detection set. Let me give you an example of a particularly likely trajectory. Okay? So in the first measurement, we get something. It's not the most likely thing, but that's enough to tip our, our knowledge for it being on the top shelf. That causes the distribution to move over. And now if I detect even the most likely value, it continues to reconfirm what I, I learned in that first, first measurement. Okay? So it continues to push the distribution further over. Most of the time. So it keeps pushing the distribution, making that, that trajectory very likely. <coughs> this is some sense an example of what we see. Now here's an example of an unlikely trajectory. Let's do this in the movie in reverse. What does it take to unlearn that information we just acquired? Okay. So we want to, we're pretty sure that it's on the top shelf, point almost vertically, and we want to sort of see what it would take to unhappen, un, to undo that information. Okay, so to do that, I need to detect very few photons, but that's incredibly unlikely. Okay, and I need to repeatedly detect very few photons in order to, to uncollapse this, this wave function. Okay, 
But if I do that, it's physically allowed, then I can do, look at the time reverse of that the, the forward trajectory. Yeah, so just like we had this analogy of there are many, the way you can distinguish past from future when you're looking at your kids' bedrooms is that uh, it's easy to go from clean to dirty, but it's hard to go from dirty to clean, or by, by easy hard, I mean likely versus unlikely. And what we understand that is that is the fact that you can use the entropy argument. That there are many, many ways for a room to be messy, but only really one or a very few number of ways for the room to be clean. All right, and so that kind of uh, uh, what we call the we call it the, that the, the, the statistical error of time that all of the things give being equal, nature tends to go from an ordered state to a disordered state. So in some sense, I can look at these movies and I can just multiply together the probabilities of each action event. The probability of that movie happens to be, you know, based on how tight the edge might have been and so forth, that happens to be incredibly unlikely, 10 to the minus 300, okay? But I can compare that to the probability of the backwards movie, which happens to be something like 10 to the minus 310. Okay, so the forwards movie is 10 to 10 times more likely than the backwards movie. It's a pretty strong, in some sense, pretty confident guess that which way the movie is going. So we do this uh, many, many times on uh, an experiment. We see you know, we can make a distribution of it. So we're looking at the logarithm of the forward probability over the backward probability. That is, if this is positive, it's more likely it's going forward. That's blue. If it's negative, it's more likely going backwards. What do we see? Well, on average, the, the mean of this is more likely to be going forward. So, so but, this is what you mean. So on average, it looks like time is moving forward. But some of the time, as a fluctuation, it can look like to us like time is going backward. Yeah. I think that's our that's our conclusion. So what have we what have we, we learned in in this uh, last 50 minutes of so the first thing we learned was that if I take the laws of classical physics, they're reversible. I just simply, I simply hit the rewind button, I take t to minus t, the velocity to minus velocity, and I get a perfectly legitimate forward movie that's perfectly described by the ordinary laws of classical physics. Okay, but we can tell past and future by which one's more likely. In some sense, the transition from order to disorder. You can tell that this is you know, before and this is after. This is the second law of thermodynamics. So the second thing we learn is that if I think about the microscopic physics, the physics of atoms and molecules and photons, that this physics is also time reversible. That if I take the time to minus the time and I make some transformation on the wave function, that plane the movie backward is also perfectly described by the law of Schrodinger. Except when it's not. Like this whole wave function collapse and the cats that are dead and alive and so forth. You can't, that's a, it's so impossible to uncollapse this building. Right? And finally, but, but on the other hand, Cater, we finally learned that even quantum measurement itself can also be time reversed. That if you look at this picture, this is a picture of one of the movies with the soundtrack, that if we think about the movie going forward in time, that's a perfectly legitimate point of view. But we could also think about the movie going backward in time starting at the red dot and going backward from past to future is also a perfectly legitimate uh, and corresponds with our best theories of quantum measure. But we can still tell past from future okay, by looking at the probabilities of these movies. In this case, it's a transition from disorder to order okay, as we learn more about the system. The outcome is unknown until it's known. So sometimes it's the opposite. In one case, order to disorder, in other cases, disorder to order. Which is pretty darn profound. Okay, finishing here again with, with uh, <laughs> Let us quickly acknowledge uh, some of the wonderful people who helped with this work, uh, the greatest collaborators on the world, and our funding sources. And there's our logo, logo for our talk. So we have Janice looking forward in time, looking measurements going essentially from past to future and getting results. But equivalently, the backward Janus face could also be looking from future to past with a different set of measurements and simply time reversing those results.